Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here at Housing Works Bookstore Cafe on this rainy, rainy night. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm the Director of Public Programming. And I'm just going to take a minute to tell you about Housing Works before we get started. Um, is there anyone who has not been here before? Anybody? Anybody? All right. Um, welcome. We're part of Housing Works Inc. We are the nation's largest community-based aid service organization. We provide housing, health care, job training, advocacy, and other direct services to homeless New Yorkers living with HIV and AIDS. It's a really important cause, and we're proud to be a part of it. And the way that we do that is through social enterprise. So all the books have been donated to us, the CDs, the DVDs, and the people pouring your coffee and ringing up your purchases are volunteers. It means any money you spend while you're here is going directly to help someone. So for example, if you're drinking a beer, you're doing a good deed, and we commend you. If you'd like to have some more beer, 10 glasses of wine, or you know, buy yourself a set of encyclopedias, um, it, it, it all goes to a great cause. So we just really appreciate um, anything you can do. At the same time, um, the poets tonight are all donating their time. The featured books tonight have been donated to us, um, including some from nice little indie presses. So I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, please buy those books. They are cover price, but all the money is going directly to Housing Works to help someone. And um, they're great also. Um, if you'd like to become a member of Housing Works, you can also get one free. If you'd like to know more about that, you can ask at the front counter. If you'd like to know how to donate your time, how to donate your books, how to hold an event here, how to get married here, um, we do all kinds of things every Saturday. Um, and we would love to have you back. We have an email newsletter that goes out every other week and is hilarious, so please sign yourself up for that. Um, we just do a ton of free events. Tomorrow night, Rolling Stone is presenting long-form journalism. Thursday night is comedy about Passover. Next week, there's another poetry event on Wednesday. There's a big country concert coming up. So whatever you're into, um, we'd be really glad to have you back. Um, that's it for me. I'm just really, really excited about this event tonight. And um, to tell you the rest of it, uh, Leslie Shipman, Director of Programs at the National Book Foundation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rachel. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Housing Works and to the National Book Foundation's National Poetry Month reading, featuring three extraordinary poets who have either won or been a finalist for the National Book Award. I love National Poetry Month. I'm also exhausted by it. <laughs> but there are so many great readings to attend during National Poetry Month, and I'm glad you guys are here for this one. Um, tonight's reading is part of the Foundation's Lineage Program, an ongoing retrospective that's examining 61 years of National Book Award winning poetry through public programs in three cities and a daily blog on each winning title written by a group of emerging poets. Please pick up a copy of our poetry timeline and brochure, which has our web address, which is on the information table, which is also where you'll find the books that are for sale tonight. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank Rachel Fertilizer at Housing Works for making tonight's event possible. I'd also like to thank the National Endowment for the Arts and, of course, the hardest working staff in literature, my colleagues at the National Book Foundation. Last night, David Orr, Dwight Garner, and Sam Tenenhaus from the New York Times, Laura Miller from Salon, Tree Swenson from the Academy of American Poets, and Robin Cresswell, poetry editor of the Paris Review, had a lively discussion entitled Poetry and the Public about the place poetry occupies in our public life. Notably absent from that panel was, well, actual living, breathing poets, who I know for a fact hold very passionate opinions about such topics. David Orr, who was the primary, primary motivator behind last night's discussion, had originally wanted poets on the panel, but the New York Times, in its infinite wisdom, said he could not be on a panel with writers whose books he may someday review. And thus, tonight's event was born. So I've asked tonight's readers to think about the place contemporary poetry occupies in American culture as well as issues specific to the making of modern poetry, and to, and to introduce us to their own work through that particular lens. We're going to hear from three leading American poets tonight, Mark Doty, Kathleen Graber, and Patricia Smith. Um, actually, Kathleen's going to read first, then Mark, and then Patricia. Um, I'm going to read their bios all at once, and then they'll each come up for about 15 minutes. And I'll reserve the final 15 minutes at the end of the program for your questions. So I'll start with Kathleen's bio. 
Kathleen Graber is the author of two collections of poetry, The Eternal City, Princeton 2010, was a finalist for both the National Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award. She teaches in the Creative Writing Program at Virginia Commonwealth University. Mark Doty's Fire to Fire, New and Selected Poems, won the National Book Award for Poetry in 2008. He's the author of seven other books, four volumes of nonfiction prose, and most recently, a handbook for writers called The Art of Description from Grey Wolf. He lives in New York City and teaches at Rutgers University. And finally, Patricia Smith is the author of five books of poetry, including Bud Blood Dazzler, chronicling the tragedy of Hurricane Katrina, which was a finalist for the 2008 National Book Award and one of NPR's top five books of 2008, and Tea House of the Almighty, a national poetry series selection. She's a Pushcart Prize winner and four-time individual champion of the National Poetry Slam, the most successful poet in the competition's history. She's a professor at the City University of New York, College of Staten Island, and is on the faculty of both Cave Canem and the Stone Coast MFA program at the University of Southern Maine. So please, please uh, join me in welcoming our first poet tonight, Kathleen Graber. Uh, thank you very much for coming out and thanks to Housing Works for house housing us, um, hosting us tonight. Um, it's a pleasure to read with Mark and Patricia. Um, I was here last night in the audience at the um, critics panel, and uh, to, to sum up for those of you who weren't here, I can say that um, probably when people talk about poetry in the public, they're talking about two issues primarily, and those would be accessibility and politics. And so the question seems to be, um, why aren't poems more accessible and easy to understand, and hence they would be more popular if they were? And also, why aren't poets more involved in the political life of the country? I don't have to answer those questions. They were all answered last night. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I did think about that a little bit when I was trying to decide what to read tonight. And in our early... Uh, exchange of emails, it was proposed that we might read poems by others besides ourselves. And I wanted to read this poem by Con the Greek poet Constantine Kavafi. And the cover of The Collected says, um, the foremost Greek poet of the 20th century. And I think, I think that's probably true. Um, but it came to my mind because there's not too long ago, uh, a friend of mine said, I've had the most amazing day today. Everywhere I went, people were saying, Kavafi, Kavafi, Kavafi. <laughs> and I thought, what, what paradise is this where everywhere people are talking about Kavafi's poems? And then, of course, it dawned on him that they were saying, Kadafi, Kadafi, <laughs> Kadafi. And so I think that says something about the relative place of uh, poetry in public discourse. Um, but then when we thought about it longer, we realized that actually they could be saying both Kavafi and Qaddafi together. Um, as uh, Kavafi, though, reigning in Greek, um, spent most of his time in Egypt. Um, and this is actually a poem of his uh, called The God Forsakes Antony, which is uh, an imagining of um, Antony's last moments as uh, the reigning king of Egypt uh, when Octavian comes and uh, attacks and he hears the, the troop approaching through the streets. Uh, the God forsakes Antony. When suddenly at the midnight hour an invisible troop is heard passing with exquisite music, with shouts, do not mourn in vain your fortune failing you now. Your works that have failed the plans of your life that have turned out to be illusions. As if long prepared for this, as if courageous, bid farewell, I'm sorry, bid farewell the Alexandria that is leaving. Above all, do not be fooled. Do not tell yourself it is only a dream, that your ears deceive you. Do not stoop to such vain hopes. As if long prepared for this, as if courageous, as it becomes you who are worthy of such a city, approach the window with firm step 
and listen with emotion, but not with the entreaties and complaints of the coward. As a last enjoyment, listen to the sounds, the exquisite instruments of the mystical troop, and bid her farewell, the Alexandria you are losing. Um, this po I find this poem incredibly moving, and I don't find it incredibly moving because it's political. I find it incredibly moving because it speaks so personally to the human condition, um, to the fact that we are, all, we are all inevitably going to lose our Alexandria, um, and that we ought to comport ourselves with decorum in that moment, which is very, very difficult. I noticed last night when I was in the audience that this is really strange. So can, if I stand back from this, can you hear me? Is this okay? Okay, because I don't want to reverberate everywhere. Um, so not thinking about uh, Kavafi at all when I was working on this project, I realized it's not totally um, non-conversant with his project. Uh, in the middle of the Eternal City are, is a little cycle of poems that are in conversation with the Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius, um, who was a Stoic, uh, who, didn't, who despite being king had really wanted to be a philosopher. Um, he was constantly under siege from barbarians, as all Roman emperors are. And, uh, and the two that gave him a lot of trouble that he wrote about in his meditations are the Quadi and the Parthians. Um, this is book three. This is actually a poem that, in which the public appears. So in case you haven't met the public, I'd like, I'd like you to, to, to I, had, um, I don't know if many poets can say this. I, for most of my life, I had a business on the boardwalk in Wildwood, New Jersey. Um, so I know the public quite intimately. Um, so anyway, so this is book three. It has an epigraph from Aurelius. They know not how many things are signified by the words stealing, sowing, buying, keeping quiet, seeing what ought to be done, for this is not affected by the eyes, but by another kind of vision. Remember the Quadi and the Parthians. Never allow them into your life. Last night at work, before I knew it, while I was busy selling a t-shirt, the one with the glow-in-the-dark skeleton in the electric chair to Canadian tourists, an addict convinced me to keep an eye on his six-year-old son. Slurring something as simple as don't let him go nowhere, he turned and stepped into the Congress of Night Strollers on the boardwalk. Where did he go, the child wondered. After 10 minutes, he asked, how long has he been gone? Soon, though, the father returned, stood in the doorway of the shop, called his son's name once, and they vanished. In his relief, the boy forgot the jarred goldfish he'd won by tossing a coin into its bowl. At midnight, I placed it into the open hand of a sunburnt girl wearing thick black glasses, knee-high socks, and a 14-gauge surgical steel lip ring. Having lost somewhere in the past the urge to take so grave a responsibility upon myself. The fish will die. Maybe it's dead already. And I'm tired of feeling sad. What is this other kind of vision that recognizes already the end in sight, that foresees only disaster? Today, I'm giving away two bags of clothing I've never worn and then I'm going to run in place at the gym while I listen to Moby Dick on tape. We discussed puppets and how much he likes the big blocks at school. We considered how slowly time seems to pass when you're waiting. And then I'm just going to read one other poem. Um, it's actually a poem about poems, which is really you know, something you're warned uh, always never to do. And, and I tell my students, no, no, no poems about poems. Um, but since this is poetry in the public, it feels like if there were ever a time to read the poem about poems, this is the place. Um, the question came up last night about whether or not um, all American poets think of themselves as a part of a single community and whether if put to the question, 